for them with what he did after he said those words. We begin our worship tonight where we're going to meditate on communion and holy communion and what is it and what do we mean when we say holy communion with a hymn 136, Twas on that dark, that doleful night. join in the opening dialogue. On this night, Christ Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room and ate with the one who would betray him. On this night, Christ, the suffering servant, took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, saying, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. On this night, Christ our Lord gave us his holy supper, that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may proclaim his death, receive his body and blood, have his forgiveness, and on the last day share in his resurrection. On this night, Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him and was abandoned by those who follow him. We pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God pictured in the ancient Passover feast, now giving to us your own body and your own blood in Holy Communion. Just as the Passover lambs assured the Israelites of God's promise to deliver them from death, strengthen our belief that the bread is your real body and the wine is your real blood, given to us for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. Prepare us to receive this sacrament, remembering your death and repenting of our sins. 
unite us by our oneness of faith throughout this congregation and our synod, and love us to the end, that we may love others as you have loved us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This evening we're going to hear about covenants. Um, we hear about covenants in each of the lessons this evening. The first lesson is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, where the Lord declares through the prophet Jeremiah that days are coming when he's going to have a new covenant. Now, Jesus talks about the new covenant being fulfilled in this supper we're celebrating but let's also talk about, just more generically, how this new covenant was forgiveness of sins declared. It was knowledge of the Lord given in a special way through the Holy Spirit. What was the old covenant, the first covenant? That was the covenant given at Sinai. Here's my laws, you will keep my laws, I will be your God. There was sort of a two-way transaction going on. God was their God but there was an obedience factor that they failed to keep. They broke that covenant. So God said, and really he was always thinking this is where he was going, right? God doesn't have plan B. He just has stage A and stage B in his plan. Well, stage B was to provide what the people failed to bring, to provide salvation, to give, declare forgiveness on the basis of the blood of the Lamb. Listen to Jeremiah prophesy of this truth. Yes, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant of mine, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or each one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their guilt and I will remember their sins no more. This is the word of our Lord. We join in verse 1 of Hymn 112. a fountain filled with blood Emmanuel was slain and sinners who are washed therein lose every guilty stain lose every guilty stain Our second lesson is from the writer to the Hebrews, uh, his book in the New Testament, chapter 10. Again, he quotes what Jeremiah prophesied by the Lord's inspiration, and then he comments on it. He says, this, for, this covenant of sins forgiven, of sins no longer remembered, will be fulfilled through the blood of the Messiah, through the blood of Jesus. Um, remember in the tabernacle and then also in the temple there were sort of levels of holiness. You had the outer court and then you had the inner court and then you had the holiest of holies, which is where in the, in the tabernacle at least the Ark of the Covenant resided. And you had a separation visibly represented by the architecture of the temple. We, we are separated from our God by our sins. And the Lord, to remind his people of that truth, caused there to be that separation, that wall, that barrier between the people and even most of the priests, most of the time, they couldn't get into the Holy of Holies. Only once a year could the high priest enter. And then with great ceremony. What was visually represented by the Holy of Holies is true of us as well. We are separated from God, but the blood of Jesus bridges the gap. When Jesus paid the price at the cross, we now were reconciled with God through faith. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews tells us. The Holy Spirit also testifies in Scripture to us. For first, he said, 
This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their mind. Then he adds, and I will not remember their sins and their lawlessness any longer. Now where these sins are forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Brothers, we have confidence to enter the most holy place through the blood of Jesus. It is a new and living way he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. We also have a great priest over the house of God. So let us approach with a sincere heart in the full confidence of faith because our hearts have been sprinkled to take away a bad conscience and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold on firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. Let us also consider carefully how to spur each other on to love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together as some have the habit of doing. Rather, let us encourage each other. And all the more, as you see the day approaching. This is the word of our Lord. We join in hymn 112, verse 3. Dear dying Lamb, your precious blood shall never lose its power. of God be saved and sin no more be saved and sin no more please rise for our gospel lesson so on the back page of your worship folder are four texts that represent the four authors of scripture human authors that the Lord inspired to record the words of institution for us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul in 1 Corinthians. And you'll notice that they have slightly different takes on it. Not that they disagree, but that some will focus on one aspect of what Jesus said, others on other aspects. Tonight we'll be using essentially Paul's. That's the one that's closest to what we speak in, in our worship services. Well, our gospel lesson is including of the Luke verses, but more of what was around it. So you're going to hear the entire event, what happened around those words of institution that our Lord gave us. The day of unleavened bread arrived when it was necessary to sacrifice the Passover lamb. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? He told them, just as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Tell the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large furnished upper room. Make preparations there. They went and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the 12 apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is being poured out for you. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We join in hymn 714. That's the hymn printed on the insert sheet, The Lamb.
brothers and sisters in Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The sermon text for tonight really isn't a text. Um, I'm going to draw from the various four accounts of the words of institution. So I'll be drawing a little bit from each one tonight. Tonight we gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which we refer to also as Holy Communion. A communion is a, a joining together. It's a common union. And tonight we're going to look at and rejoice in the three communions that take place in the Lord's Supper. And the first communion we'll talk about is this. The communion of the bread and the wine together with the body and blood of Christ kind of the core of what's going on, isn't it? Now, if you're at a dinner party and you're wondering what you're eating, maybe all you have to do is look at and taste the food, right? If what you're holding looks like an orange and tastes like an orange, you're probably eating an orange. It's a little different maybe with something like meatloaf. You can discern that there's meat in there, but unless you have really good taste buds, you might have some difficulty knowing exactly what the other ingredients are. And if you wanted to be certain, what would you do? You would ask the host what's in the meal. Well, it's easy to look at and taste the Lord's Supper and realize that wine is present and bread is too. Anyone who denies this would not only be denying their own taste buds, but denying the Word of God, which tells us in Luke 22, that Jesus took the bread. And it quotes Jesus as referring to the fruit of the vine, which is just a Hebraic way of talking about the wine. So bread and wine clearly were and are present. But don't let your taste buds or your eyes fool you into missing that there is something else also here. Something else is joined. Something else is in a union with the bread and the wine. Listen to our host as we ask him, what is it? He says, this is my body, this is my blood. Now, someone might say to you, and you've probably heard it because I have, wasn't Jesus just speaking figuratively when he said this? Wasn't he just saying perhaps that the, the redness, the liquid nature of the wine are similar to his blood and that the bread is somehow like his flesh? And I would agree that that would be a reasonable argument if I had said what Jesus had said. Because if you were sitting in my home and I gave you bread to eat and said, this is my body, it ought to be clear to you that I had been speaking figuratively. Because my body is sitting across the table from you and I don't have the ability to be in two places at once. But Jesus does. He can be in several places at once. Why? Because as God, he has the ability to do anything he chooses to do. And therefore, if Jesus says, this is my body, we accept that it is his body. That he, he says what he means and he means what he says. But we also note that Jesus refers to this all as a new covenant. Sort of a looking back at that promise of Jeremiah. And let's talk about covenants, because covenants are, they were, solemn agreements. They're binding contracts. And just like documents today that are considered covenants, back then covenants required precise language. Language that said exactly what it meant. And as the Son of God, Jesus knew that the words he would speak would be written down and then remembered and, and recited for years and years come. If Jesus had intended for us to understand those words any way other than the plain surface meaning, there were ways he could have told us that. There were other phrases in the Greek or the Aramaic that he was probably speaking that were chosen to convey the meaning. If he meant it, this looks like my body, or this symbolizes my blood, or this will remind people of my body and blood. But Jesus didn't choose any of those words, any of those ways of speaking. If, on the other hand, he intended us to 
believe that it was in fact his true body and blood in union with the bread and the wine in a miraculous way, he would have said exactly what he did. This is my body, this is my blood, plain language. We also note that the early New Testament church clearly believed that Jesus' body and blood were present. Consider the words of St. Paul, who wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, these words, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Those are pretty serious words, aren't they? They're serious words about something serious that is going on. He says, when we eat and drink of this sacrament, we ought to discern, we ought to recognize the body of the Lord as truly present. And he says, those who receive the sacrament without faith, they sin against, not bread and wine, no, he says, they sin against the body and blood of the Lord that's in union with the bread and the wine. Martin Luther, our spiritual forefather, said it well. If a hundred thousand devils should rush forward and ask that question, how can bread and wine also be the body and blood of Christ? We know that all of the demons, together with all the scholars of this world, do not have as much wisdom together as God has in his little finger. And if he says it, he means it. Right? This is my body. This is my blood. The words of Christ are clear, and they will stand forever. And he means what he says, and he says what he means. That's communion number one. The bread and the wine together with the body and the blood of Christ. Communion number two. Sinners and God. Because that is also happening at the Lord's table. And there are many different levels of communion, or we'll call it friendship in our world. For example, people that you knew in high school or, or maybe college. Maybe you exchange Christmas cards with them. Maybe you even call them once in a great while when somebody you know dies. Or, or you have some other event to talk about, maybe a class reunion. And when you do, the small talk often goes like this. You know, I'm, I'm, I come through your area once in a while. Maybe I should stop in uh, for the weekend sometime. And you say, oh, that would be great. But down deep, you're not really so sure of what you just said. You might actually say to yourself, I kind of hope they don't. Because while exchanging cards once a year and occasionally talking on the phone, well, that's one thing. But having them in my home for a whole weekend... That's another level of intimacy, and we never were that close. And you both know it. Or maybe you have neighbors with whom you are friendly in a very um, regular, normal, everyday kind of way. You, you spend a few minutes talking to them when you're out getting your mail. And over the years, you've gotten to know them pretty well, reasonably well, but they've never invited you inside. And they probably never will because, again, your friendship isn't at that level of intimacy. But then there are, of course, some people in your world that you would never consider inviting in your house or in for dinner. Because you just can't stand them. You just can't stand them and maybe the way they've treated you, they just don't deserve it, right? That is basically what our relationship with God was before Christ reconciled us to our Father. See, there was no way that he would ever invite us to join him at his table. Our relationship with God was so bad that we shouldn't have even thought of being invited. We shouldn't have even stepped on his lawn to retrieve our newspaper. We're going to use the neighbor picture, right? But understand this, God isn't like that grumpy old man whose only joy in life is shouting at kids who happened to stray six inches onto his lawn. No, God isn't that neighbor. God is like our neighbor, who has repeatedly been forced to deal with our obnoxious attitudes. God is like a neighbor whose gentle requests to turn down the music have been met with even louder music. 
like a neighbor who loans us something we need for a project, perhaps. And then when he comes back to get it from us, is told to get lost. Go buy your own. Now that sounds ridiculous, right? You're like, Pastor, it's his. He should get it back. Okay, it sounds ridiculous for a reason. But consider how we've treated God in our lives. We have no reason to expect that God would have invited us to his table. When we think about how we've treated the possessions he's entrusted us with, how we've failed to keep his commands, how we've trespassed, how we've often given him the cold shoulder when he draws near to us. I mean, we wouldn't even be surprised if he would build a big fence between his yard and our yard so that it would be impossible for us to set foot on his property. And you know, that is a little bit of the situation we were in, except we were the ones that built the fence. We built the barrier. We destroyed our relationship with God by our many sins. Paul speaks about this in Colossians chapter 1 when he says, Once you, that's us, were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And so when God plans a special intimate meal, we really wouldn't expect to be invited. And yet, that's exactly what he did. He invites us. Take and eat. Come in to my house. Take and drink. Why would God give us such a gracious, undeserved, intimate invitation? Why would he not only stoop to talk with us, but invite us for a meal? The answer is found in the meal itself. Because it is Christ's body and blood. The same body and blood which are present in this meal that at the cross reconciled us with God, that brought us and God together, that broke down that barrier that was separating us. Paul says that too. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. So he doesn't see us as that annoying neighbor. He doesn't see us as sinners, though we are. He sees us as forgiven through the blood of His Son. Is God worried about us messing up the tablecloth or otherwise spoiling His meal? No. Because through Christ's physical body, we have been made holy in His sight, without blemish. And that is exactly what Jesus Himself said when He instituted this meal. What did He say? We'll hear it again tonight. This is my body given for you. This is the blood of the, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Those are precious and special words, my friends. Because they assure us that not only is God interested in being our neighbor, he is eager to have us come to his table because he has made us worthy by the blood of his son. Although we have chosen tonight to focus on the name communion, it is in this second common union, this joining of God with believers, that the term the Lord's Supper has special meaning. Because although it is the Lord's Supper, although it is His table, His house, His food, you and I are on the guest list. And so of the three common unions that take place in Holy Communion, it is perhaps this one that is the nearest and dearest to us because it assures us that the body and blood we receive have made us worthy of the meal. Now at his table, here on earth, and forever at his table in heaven. The thing about dinner parties, though, is that sometimes you aren't sure who else is going to be there. And you might wonder if you're really going to be able to connect with them. Because the mere fact that the host invited both you and someone else to a meal, to a party, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get along or that there's going to be this close kinship. I'll give you some examples that fit me. If I'm seated next to someone at a party or at a meal, and I find out they're absolutely insane about golf and all they ever want to talk about is golf, I don't think we're going to have a lot to talk about. And please don't take offense. Don't throw me out. I just hate golf. I tried it once or twice, and it was terrible, and I didn't like it. I think it's stupid, so you probably don't like it. 
But on the other hand, if you sit across the table from me and you tell me, Pastor, ham radio is dumb and outdated, I'm going to be a little bit annoyed. I'm going to be a little mildly irritated. We're not necessarily going to have anything to talk about. But give me one common thing, one important common thing that I have with another person. And there will be a unity, a bond that makes our differing opinions on trivial things like golf and ham radio comparatively comparatively insignificant and irrelevant. The disciples themselves were individually quite diverse, fishermen and tax collectors, zealots and doubters, ambitious, impromptu, and laid back and quiet. And yet they formed one group, one band of brothers. What bonded them together? In a word, Jesus. And Jesus is who binds us together, too. In Jesus, we are united. Through, though some of us are blue-collar, some of us are white-collar, some of us aren't sure what collar we're supposed to have. Some are men, some are women. Some are Republicans, some are Democrats. And although the devil does his absolute best to pit us against each other, when we approach the Lord's table in just a few minutes, we will come united. Because we are united in faith. We're united as sinners who know we are now declared saints through the blood of Christ. Tonight we may stand next to someone who votes exactly opposite of us in elections. We may stand next to someone who disagrees with us on just about every issue that comes before this congregation. But that will not matter because Jesus unites us. We will be standing next to a Christian, someone with whom we are united in faith. Paul writes, we who are many, meaning we're diverse. We who are many are one body, for we all share of the one loaf. And so tonight as I stand in front of you, with you, I will rejoice at my union with you. And as we stand next to each other, we are confessing. We are confessing that we here are one. We are confessing that as Paul says, there is one body, there is one spirit, one Lord, one faith. One baptism. Yes, we express this unity when we join together in speaking the creeds. We feel this unity when we join together in singing the hymns. And that is a unity that is very real. But I would say it is a unity that we see and feel in the most intimate and clear way when we kneel or stand together at this communion rail, shoulder to shoulder at the Lord's table. In a few moments, not too long, we will receive Holy Communion. And as we do, I pray that we may recognize the communion of bread and wine with Jesus' body and blood. I pray we rejoice in the communion between ourselves and God that has been restored through His blood. And I pray we are strengthened and encouraged by the communion that we have with one another through His blood. In Jesus' precious name. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus your Lord. Amen. I ask the congregation to please stand. Turn to page 4 in your worship folder. And we're going to pray a responsive prayer. It's sort of combined as a prayer of the church and a Confession of our sins together with absolution, receiving of forgiveness. We pray. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son. As one of us, he knew our joys and sorrows. He shared our struggle with temptation. He was like us in every way, and yet had no sin. In him we see how you created us to be. Though blameless, he suffered willingly for our sin. Though innocent, he accepted death for the guilty. On the cross, he offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. By his suffering and death, he frees us from sin and death. Risen from the grave, he leads us to the joy of a new life. Increase our faith, O Lord, 
and give us courage to confess it. Increase our faith as we receive your word and sacrament. Amen. In the Lord's Supper, Christ is present by the power of his word and offers us his body, given into death, and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. As we prepare to receive these great gifts, let us confess our sins and hear the promise of forgiveness. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. And let his face shine upon us as we trust in his forgiveness. As you believe, so let it be. By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is, my new te this is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Our Lord Jesus has given us a holy supper in which we receive his true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith. In this supper, we celebrate the gift of his redemption. We bear witness to the fellowship we share as confessors of the truth, and we proclaim his death until he returns. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I invite those who are members of our communing fellowship or of sister congregations of our synod to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper as they desire. The distribution hymns which will be begun after the first table is served are listed in your worship.
take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of your Savior, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, poured out for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this, the true body and blood of your Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace knowing your sins are forgiven. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of your Savior, given unto death for your sins. of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of your Savior, poured out for your sins. May this, the true body and blood of your Savior, strengthen and preserve you with the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace, knowing your sins are forgiven. body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace knowing your sins are forgiven. body and blood of Jesus, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace knowing your sins are forgiven. Amen.
body of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of your Savior, given unto death for your sins. body and blood of your Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace knowing your sins are forgiven. Christ given unto death for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior poured out for you on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. May this, the true body and blood of Jesus, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. body and blood of Jesus, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith, to life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. Oh 
thanksgiving, alleluia, alleluia. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of your triune God. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 112, verses 2, 4, and 5. That fountain in his day, and there have I as vile as he. Good evening. It's good to be here with you. It's great to worship with you, to celebrate our unity, to celebrate our Lord's promise of forgiveness to us. Tomorrow is sort of the low point. I won't call it the high point, but in a sense the high point of Holy Week because Jesus was lifted up on a cross, right? And Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. The picture there was as he was lifted on the cross, the world saw in him the sacrifice for their sins. The low point, which was a high point, um, tomorrow evening. We gather here for worship at 7 p.m. to meditate on the seven times that Jesus spoke from the cross, or at least as are recorded in Scripture for us. Look forward to seeing many of you here tomorrow evening as well. Um, take some time, read those four versions of the words of institution. And take note that the one we use in worship is very close to 1 Corinthians. It seems like Paul had sort of stitched together some of what the Gospel writers had recorded in one place by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and God keep you.